you will uh, uh, meet the new directors of research and uh, we'll also hear about advancement in a new science opportunity with the new beam lights. So I just going to summarize uh, this concept in a, a very uh, um, uh, rapid uh, presentation uh, in which, uh, um, you know, um, besides welcome you, uh, which I just did, I want to, uh, um, okay. Um, first of all, mark the fact that uh, we have uh, already one year of uh, EBS uh, operation with users. And um, in fact, it's almost a one year and a half. Uh, we restarted, as you remember, on the 25th of August of 2020. So um, the uh, uh, new storage ring is uh, getting to its maturity. A lot of teething issues uh, have been solved. Others uh, still need attention, but uh, we can conclude uh, that uh, the design parameters uh, uh, been either reached and encompassed, and a few of them, in particular, the uh, current in the timing mode, uh, will be soon, I hope, uh, um, obtained. Uh, I've been bounced out by, from the presentation. I don't know why. <clears throat> so I'm going to start again. Okay. So um, uh, a lot of work has been going on also to uh, uh, complete the EBS program, and in particular, the delivery of the flagship beam lines, but also the refurbishment, uh, major refurbishment of other ESRF beam lines. And you will hear about that. For example, the first monochromatic beam on ID29 was seen in July 2021. This is the beam line um, uh, dedicated uh, to uh, macromolecular crystallography and, in particular, serial crystallography. And then also uh, we got uh, the first beam in the experimental arch of BM18 uh, dedicated to phase contrast um, um, CT, and uh, that got beam in uh, 2020 September 2021, and is now um, starting the first experiments. Uh, we also had a um, uh, very rapid and fantastic uh, delivery of uh, um, uh, ID27 that received the, the first users in November of last year. And also now we can see the first data from the high power laser facility. So you will hear about uh, these um, four major accomplishment. And also I cannot resist uh, to uh, share with you uh, some uh, very positive feedback uh, that many of you, many users already sent to us uh, um, for um, learning and uh, uh, appreciating uh, the opportunities of the EBS. I also mentioned that uh, we are at a time of changes and uh, last year, uh, at the end of last year, uh, both Gordon Leonard who was a director of research for life sciences until the 31st of December. And uh, Harold, uh, that uh, uh, was director of research for a very long period, since uh, 1st of January 2009 until the end of last year, um, left the ESRF. And I think uh, it's uh, uh, we, we want to profit uh, to thank them for their dedication and also to note uh, how much Harold was involved in the successful delivery of the upgrade program phase one with 19 flagship beam line, the EBS program um, development, the science case definition and the delivery and much, much more. So thanks, Harold. And of course, we have uh, two new directors of research that you will meet right after me, Gemma and Annalisa, respectively, director of research for condensed matter and physical and material sciences and life science, chemistry and soft matter science, respectively. They <coughs> will introduce themselves and uh, talk to you um, in a moment about uh, um, the future plan of uh, um, the experimental program. And uh, finally, as uh, every year, we were on time to deliver the ESRF highlights. These are out. You can get them on um, uh, the website that is indicated here. And of course, uh, we also have uh, paper copies that we can send to you should you wish to have one. So again, a big thanks to all the ESRF users that made this publication possible and also my personal thanks to all the ESRF colleagues and in particular the communication group that has contributed to the timely um, publishing of the ESRF highlights. So with this, with this I end my uh, uh, introduction 
and I give the uh, word to um, Annalisa, uh, who, sorry, to, uh, to Hema, I think, right? Which will uh, uh, give information on the status of the Beamline's construction and operation program. And she will be followed by um, four uh, 10 minutes uh, updates uh, uh, of uh, DM18, ID24, ID27, and, uh, um, and uh, ID29. Yes. Uh, and finally, Annalisa will give uh, um, a final uh, uh, speech uh, on uh, uh, informing you about uh, the development of new community access modes that uh, ESRF is uh, um, uh, putting together and uh, soon bring uh, to the, uh, 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 made them available to the users. So thank you very much for your uh, attention and um, Hema, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to share with you some time, even on Zoom. Um, so I want to thank the organizing committee because we really enjoy a lot the, the previous speakers' uh, plenary talk. So, well, I'm going to talk to about the status of the Binan Construction Operation Program briefly because uh, later on you will get an extension by the scientists involved. So as Francesco said, uh, we have already a year and a half <laughs> birthday of the EBS with outstanding um, performance uh, for the very young machines, let's say, in terms of uh, beam time availability, but also most important coherence, emittance, brilliance, lifetime. So we are very happy to profit from it. Uh, but however, uh, so far we have been impacted by the COVID situation, COVID-19 situation. Uh, as you all know, the, everything is, well, the, the EBS restart uh, in August 2020 uh, implied basically a quite of uh, support from the SRF side for the, for, from, from the structural biology group and the prior end for the COVID research. Later on in, in April 2021, there was a lockdown with very important measures applied. So uh, DSRF put in place a remote access mode and 68% of the experiment were carried out in remote access with a lot of automations, um, increase of the postal staff to support the, the user experiment. In September 2021, there was a lighter the restriction, so we went back to the six days per week in USM. Uh, remote modes uh, access is still an option, and 38% of the experiments were carried out in, in this mode. Then later on, we got in, in, in December the Omicron variant, and we again got some measures that impact the user uh, program. We know that a few of the experiments were canceled. But now, February 2022, we are back to normal schedule, and we hopefully hope uh, that we will be able to, to welcome all of you here on site with a larger number of experiments uh, with always the uh, remote access available in case that uh, it's possible. So plans, well, uh, what are the plans? Uh, let's put it in this way. The, the medium term scientific program of the SRIF, uh, which regularly is submitted uh, to our council, set some clear actions and planned developments for the next uh, years. It's a five-year rolling plan that cover all the required resources to keep the, the best performance of the, not only of the EBS, but also the, the all the instrumentation building and, and all the capa capability of the SRIF. It uh, covers not only the four new big lines fully optimized for EBS, but as well as a strong reformist program with many big lines on running on in it, ID18, ID21, ID24, ID26, the 26, 27, BM23. Also the preventive measurements to, to, to keep the accelerators in highest level of the standards. Uh, also uh, given a better performance instead of, of current uh, insertion device and so on. A new <clears throat> detector development plan to, to, for, for improvement of the, uh, let's say, scattering a diffraction detector system in-house, 
this is the case of side and speeds for, for high uh, dynamic trains at low uh, faster without detectors. New access modes that will be presented by Annalisa in the next uh, uh, talk. We also have a data trade data strategy implementation plan to, to phase the, the increase on data volume given by not only the, the short X-ray experiment because of the EVS, but also the, the, the number of, of, of detectors that are every time larger with smaller pixels uh, and higher frame rates. So also the new beamline control software, this and scientific software library. So many actions that all of them wants to, to, to improve the, the, our performance uh, in terms of um, capabilities. So if we have a look, a quick look to a graph view of our experimental hall, we see that the, the reported VLAN and the EDSL VLANs are overspread uh, over the ring. So if we quickly check and they, they are, um, let's say, layout and, and status, we see that, okay, the first one, EVSL1, ID18, it's a VLAN for coherent application. It is based on the speckle formation for scatter, from scattering objects with uh, complex structures. The goal is to, to get a structure and dynamics of complex systems applied to atomic dynamics in deeply super, super cool melt and structural grasses, amorphous precursor for biomineral, biomineralization, protein dynamics, colloids, and so on. So it's a very long beam line that. 20, 25 meters that profit from the increase in the coherence of the EVS. And it will is right now on the construction phase. Actually, the, the TDR finished last week. We have a well the EVS L2, it's ID3 being line for hard X-ray microscopy, based on the generation of a real image uh, using the diffracted beam as illumination. It's a for, for multi-scale diff. 3D imaging based on, on dark field X-ray microscopy for internal uh, orientations, grain shapes, and strains on lengths scale from 100 nanometers to one millimeter. Um, has a lot of applications of metals, ceramics, minerals, biomaterials. Uh, is on the construction phase. A EVSL3 is a high throughput large field uh, phase contrast tomography beamline. You will get more details uh, from Paul Taffero later on for, for multi scale phase contrast imaging, large, very large uh, sample size. I mean, we are talking about from 2.5 meters down to finest structures below the organelles uh, level with a maximum sample weight of 300 kilograms. And it's uh, quite supported by, by external funding through the Shant Zuckerberg Initiative and BMBF grant from Hofer Institute. This V line is the uh, next one is ID 29, EVSL 8, detection of molecular changes at atomic and temporal resolution by time resolved uh, serial uh, macromolecular crystallography. It's a V line designed to, to, to go deeper in size into the drug discovery and intermediate states and thematic processes in biology and so on. Uh, the V line is nearly finished. I will show you later on the timeline. Then ID21, which is a X-ray microscopy beam line for the identification and localization of low set elements, metals within heterogeneous matrices. It's a beam line that uh, actually target environmental science subjects, uh, biomedical and cultural heritage. Right now they are with the commissioning of the double crystal monochromator and um, it's as well nearly finished. ID27 for high flux uh, nano X ray diffraction beam. They got the first user last uh, November 2021. It's a fully optimized for monochromatic high resolution X ray diffraction at high temperatures and pressure. The techniques cover X ray diffraction, X ray fluorescence, and X ray imaging. Uh, the goal is to go for very small um, volumes at extreme conditions. And uh, the beam line, uh, well, uh, it's a uh, targeting high density physics synthesis of super hard materials, transport uh, or crystallization under extreme condition, peak region, plant, and so on. And um, finally, ID24 high power laser facility, as well, you will get more insights in later on from Rafaela. It's a laser chocolate compression uh, based uh, beam line 
the idea is to go uh, to get a time resolved single uh, bound X ray uh, absorption spectroscopy while there's a laser induced dynamic compression within the sample. So the, the beamline got the first data in December 2021. And here, just, just an example of the calibration used on the items to transition from DCC to HPC. So the timeline is uh, basically from 2021 to 2026, 25. The ID27, ID, um, the high pressure uh, facility, and ID21, they are almost finished. I did 24, the, the high brilliant spectroscopy, microspectroscopy station is on the construction, still with dealing with the monochromator. I did 29, and I did BN18, they are nearly finished with some construction, some restriction for BN18 in sample size for the time being and, and weight, because the sample state is not yet, the final sample state is not ready. I did three. And ID18, they are on the construction and supposed to be open in 2024. And finally, ID18 for coherence applications, it's just finished the TDR, as I said last week, and they, it will plan, it's planned to be open to use it in 2024. So the idea is, uh, as I mentioned before, is just to profit from the EVS, um, uh, let's say it's outstanding performance instead of being signed from nanometer to half a meter, Greater coherence basis approach, superior photohundred techniques, higher energies with higher fluxes, higher throughput with those tolerance and better sensitivity with the reduction of noise. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Gemma. I don't know if there is uh, time for uh, questions to Gemma, or maybe we keep everything for the... For there the there yeah. are five minutes for a question in case, but... Uh... Yeah, I, I don't see questions on the chat. So any of you that would like to ask something to the speakers, uh, uh, me included, perhaps uh, should uh, put them on the chat and uh, we will manage as they arrive. I don't see uh, questions now for Hema, so I suggest uh, we uh, uh, continue uh, with this uh, news from uh, different beam lines and uh, in the program I have, uh, the first speaker is going to be Paul, Paul Tafro, that will let us know um, what's going on on BM18. Thank you, Paul. So, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Loud and clear. And can you see my screen? Yes. So, yes, let's go. So, I will present the status. Uh, I will try to present the status of BM18. Okay, yes. <laughs> so BM18, it's EBSL3, uh, one of the flagship beamline of the EBS. Um, we, are, we are in the process of um, making the complete team. As you can see, there are already a lot of people. Um, if I would have to put all the people that really worked on the development of this beamline, I would need just 10 minutes and all the slides, so I will skip this part, but keep in mind that there are really dozens of people involved in this project. So, um, why is it not working? Uh, sorry, I have a technical problem. Try the mouse. Ah, I'm trying with many things, anyway. So BM18, it's a long beam line that is 220 meters. You can see um, where it is. It is uh, on the side of uh, ID19. And it is a beam line devoted for um, hierarchical imaging in phase contrast. So um, as mentioned already, um, the main technique is hierarchical tomography. And the beam line has been um, optimized for propagation phase contrast in order to use as much as possible the properties of the new EBS. So BM18 is made on a bending magnet port because in the new lattice of the, um, the EBS, it is the smallest possible source size where you can reach high energy. So it means we can have a large beam, a beam that is up to 35 centimeters, uh, up to 300 kilo electron volts and with an exceptional level of coherence. So because of that, we made a, uh, first a long beam line to have even better coherence, but also a very long experimental edge that gives access to 40 meters of propagation in order to have strong phase uh, at high energy on large objects. 
So it's multi-resolution. We can cover from uh, 100 microns to 0.5 microns, really. For the moment, we are still implementing the detectors. And the main, um, uh, the main uh, research topics are the material sciences for the largest part, then the biomedical imaging with uh, imaging of uh, human organs, uh, then natural and cultural heritage that includes paleontology. Uh, we have a long project on uh, geosciences and also BM18 has been optimized a lot for industrial applications. So industrial applications will be mostly in material sciences, but in fact, you can have applications in all these different topics. So uh, what we managed so far, uh, so the milestone we, we had in 2021, basically um, we are able to finish the edge to have the marble floor, to have the first beam, the radiation test, uh, to have a beautiful beam in the edge, as you can see. And beginning of December, we managed to do the first tomography slice from BM18 still with a small tomograph. So for um, uh, up to beginning of 2023, we'll have only a small tomograph. But what you have there is uh, the very first tomography slice from, um, from BM18 through a digital camera. So it was a digital camera that was not working anymore, as you can imagine. So the day just after, we made a lot of other tests. No, the same day, sorry. So digital camera, here you have an internal part. Here you have fruits, a dinosaur egg, a mammoth molar, this one is a fossil sea urchin, then a human heart. And we made the test on a human brain where you can see a bit more details. So all that was done during the first day of BIM uh, where we were able to do tomography. And uh, during the night of this first day, we decided uh, after seeing the results on the brain to scan the complete brain. And here is what we obtained. So this one is the, B, uh, the, the brain that we scanned on BM5 in uh, early 2021 using 3.5 meters of propagation. This scan was 24 hours. And then we made the same on the first day of BM18 with 38 meters of propagation is just five hours. So if you look a bit more in details, this one is a BM5 with 24 hours. And this one is BM18 with five hours. And just recently, uh, 10 days ago, we managed to make a complete human organ in less than one hour. So, and last week, we are running the first friendly user experiment with uh, the Fraunhofer team. So the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits is the main founder of the BM18 uh, project uh, out of the SRF. I mean, the SRF is the main founder, but we have uh, two big projects that, are, uh, that uh, invest a lot in BM18. It is Fraunhofer with the BMBF and the CZI for the human uh, organ research. So, um, the, this project is mostly in material sciences with very strong uh, link in the, in the industry. And what we made during last week, uh, um, even if we are just in 32 million, so with low, low current, we made a lot of tests in multi-resolution on different objects. And I will show you a very, um, very new result because I finished to process the data this morning at nine. So what you have there, it's a mobile phone that was scanned at 42 microns and 100 kilo electron volt, 180 kilo electron volt, sorry. Then the same at 24 microns. So here we are 24 microns. And then we go to 9.9 .9 microns. And then we go in another location just there and we go to, uh, we will compare the thing. So 42 microns, 24 microns, nine microns, finally 2.2 microns. And this morning I saw the first result at 0 0.6 microns, but it was a bit too, too late to include it in the, in the presentation. So we expect to start the user operation in September this year, <clears throat> meaning that we are open for proposal for the deadline of um, 1st of March. Um, so many things are done, but we are still missing two big parts on the beamline. Um, the first one, it is the detector stage. Uh, it is a, a long system that will move all along the edge on the marble floor and where you have uh, up to eight different detectors that are permanently installed and that we can switch rapidly. So it's to make the multi-resolution in an autom an automatic way. We start the assembly in the edge in the next two weeks. So in fact, it, it's already started. It's running right now. But um, the, the big thing comes in the edge in two weeks. And the second thing that comes a bit uh, later, it is the sample stage. So today we are using the small sample stage that is the same than on BM5 or BM or AD19. And here is what we are expecting for uh, installation 
in the second part of this year, the big sample stage, the one that will allow to go to sample of 2.5 meters and 300 kilograms. So if you take everything into account, here you have the beginning of the experimental hutch with the sample stage done in the pit, the detector stage, uh, the kinary slits that are not installed yet. And all that, you have to imagine that the, the hutch is 45 meters long, so the detector can move all along. So, and with that, I thank you for your attention. And as I just mentioned, we are open for proposal for the next deadline with the uh, 1st of March, just with a very important restriction for users who would like to apply for this first run as the big sample stage is not ready. We have to limit the size of the sample to 30 kilograms and 30 centimeters of diameter. Except for that, we should already have most of the multi-resolution capabilities and we can go on the full uh, X-ray spectrum of the beam. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul. That's really a, an exciting achievement. And so we all look forward for um, science now coming up. And I hope uh, the users also will be excited to try to come to work on uh, your beam line. Paul is uh, the responsible for BM18. I don't see again, uh, no specific questions uh, directly to Paul. So we wait uh, to the end eventually. And we can move to the next presentation. And it's coming from Daniele, Daniele De Santis, who's responsible for the implementation of the ID29 project. Daniele. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so uh, move on then. Um, so I'll give you a quick overview on the latest new and the progress of the ID29 upgrade uh, project that, as you know, is going on um, since a couple of years now. So uh, ID29 uh, has been, been rebuilt to become uh, a beeline for room temperature serial crystallography experiment that is able to exploit uh, time re uh, res resolved uh, studies uh, to investigate structural changes that are occur on the microsecond to the millisecond uh, time scales. And this is in order to address um, and study system that are light dependent that can be light activated, uh, study enzymology directly in crystallo so to observe the um, the, the enzymatic reaction directly in the in the crystals and to pave new way for drug design by doing direct mixing in room temperature uh, crystal uh, the B line has been designed to be tunable over a large uh, range, energy range with the streaming high flux to maximize the signal to noise when we do the experiment and a very, very high repetition rate to maximize the throughput uh, of the B line. In order to perform time resolved study, also we had to develop and uh, integrate a new control timing system to do a um, synchronized um, event and being able to adapt to different sample environment, as you will see in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, so why do we room temperature uh, data collection on crystals? Uh, as you know, MX crystallography uh, has been greatly benefited from the cryo measurements uh, that mitigates the effect of radiation damage. But uh, in the last years, I've been observed how the possibility to collect the data at room temperature, it allows to perform what are the thermal uh, distribution inside the protein. And moreover, um, cryo structure are uh, often uh, selecting structural conformation that might be inactive or might not allow the presence of the ligand in the active site and uh, uh, also the presence of cryoprotectant that allow the crystal to be uh, cryocooled might compete with the binding of ligand or uh, substrate. And doing an approach like serial crystallography here, when we take one single shot of each of the crystals, it's a good way to overcome the limitation that occur at um, a room temperature due to uh, radiation damage. Uh, moreover, when we work at room temperature on microcrystals, microcrystals can be either activated e uh, more easily if you use a light activation system, like, like using a, a laser pulse to activate and induce structural changes inside the crystals, or they can be mixed by adding uh, a substrate uh, directly to the crystal slurry and then observe the diffusion and the processing or the binding or the circular changes that the ligand uh, um, induce inside the protein structure. Um, moreover, uh, most of the en enzymatic study, they occur in uh, the, mi the microsecond to millisecond uh, time range. 
And we have optimized the B line in order to perform exactly data acquisition on these time scales, in order to be able to exploit, to fully exploit uh, the potential of studying enzymatic reaction directly uh, in the crystal. This, of course, has been uh, possible thanks to the uh, new extreme uh, billion source and with the redesigning of the optical design of ID29 that has brought up um, an increase in the flux density of uh, almost 10 to the six times um, in, in, in flux density. So this is the beeline layout. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't fit in uh, in a photo. It would be much nicer to to show. Um, the beeline construction has been, unfortunately, as uh, um, uh, Hema has uh, shown before, uh, heavily impacted by the lockdown uh, because most of the construction was planned for uh, 2020. So we had basically almost uh, stopped uh, some of the construction for five, four or five um, uh, months during the national lockdown in the spring. And we got also uh, some major delays uh, in the delivery and some increases in the cost of some of the component. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the project has progressed quite uh, well. And uh, um, I want to stress also that the, the project is not just the beeline itself, but in order to perform this kind of experiment and the time resolution and to study microcrystal, we had to develop new tools that uh, were developed in parallel and with some collaborators that, as you will see. In particular, we have developed with the MBL instrumentation group, a new diffractometer for fixed target and injector experiment, and with the electronic group, and again with the MBL instrumentation group, a new uh, electronics for synchronous uh, experiment and dynamics. And with Celeraton, which is a, a one of the sponsors of this user meeting, uh, we, had, uh, we have received just very recently a new fast shopper that will perform um, microsecond exposure time as you will see in, in a minute. And last but not least, uh, the beeline is going to be equipped with the uh, uh, Jungfrau detector, which is an uh, automatic gain switching integrating detector that has been developed um, at Swissfell uh, for Swissfell application that we will use uh, in order to record the fraction intensity from the very high flux that we are, are going to expect for a D29. And the uh, uh, ESRF uh, beeline control unit is developing uh, the new pipeline in order to uh, be able to, to cope with the high uh, data output that the Jungfrau detector is going to uh, produce since it's going to turn at the maximum speed of uh, 2 kilohertz. So this is just a schematic of how the experiment is going to uh, look like. And all of this, most of the components are either already installed or are being installed uh, at the B line. But as the B line is long, they don't fit in a single picture. So we have a two double chopper system, one that removes the power and another one that is uh, doing the fast exposure time. And we're going to get exposure time and the shortest in of 10 microseconds. That, and the beam line, the beam is focused down on a sub-micron focus uh, size uh, at the sample position. And at the sample position, we are going to integrate a high frequency um, nanosecond uh, laser that is able to excite uh, the crystals uh, uh, structure, the crystals, and uh, that operates on a large, very large energy range from the UV to the uh, infrared. The diffractometer uh, is able to accommodate both fixed target and injector experiment, and all the experiment is synchronized, uh, run synchronously with the storage ring um, radio frequency. So the storage ring uh, signal is propagated in order to get uh, the, the synchronous uh, uh, rotation of the two choppers. And the same signal, it's then used to synchronize the experiment of the micro diffractometer, the Jungfrau detector acquisition, and um, triggering uh, laser pulse or other events that uh, like injector or um, automatic adding of dispensing of liquid uh, containing ligands uh, onto the crystal. Um, so this is an overview of the uh, diffractometer. So you see this is the um, fixed target support. Uh, this is a silicon chip. You have different features here. Each of the features is uh, filled with uh, one crystal that is more or less of the size of uh, less than two micron. And we scan uh, synchronously with the uh, opening of the chopper and with the um, storage ring uh, radio frequency. And we align each of these features in front of the beam. And this is, you see the placement of each of these features in front of the beam uh, that runs synchronously. The same setup uh, um, is going to be uh, modified in order to accommodate a laser injection port that you see here, so that we can shed uh, the laser light 
directly at the sample position uh, coaxially. So to make sure that uh, we illuminate the same area and the alignment of the laser and the X-ray uh, at the same um, sample position is going to be uh, easier. Um, all this uh, triggering system uh, it can be uh, finely tuned and we can even add multiple uh, light probes at the same time um, for uh, to study more complex uh, um, reaction. As I said, the short exposure time is going to be of 10 microseconds, uh, and we're going to run a repetition rate of slightly less than 1 kilohertz, 925, which is an exact division of the uh, radio frequency. Uh, but we already see that uh, uh, since some of the development have gone better than uh, we, we planned, uh, the performance can be uh, already doubled in the near uh, in the near future. And this is an overview that uh, of uh, um, a robotic system that we are developing uh, again with the EMBL that is able to change this fixed target support directly on the B line because the full scan of um, one of this chip is going to take probably less than uh, two minutes uh, if we run at almost uh, two kilohertz. So we want to, in order to maximize the high throughput uh, of the B line, uh, we have developed some storage, sample storage cassette that are preserved um, and the sample are preserved in a humidity control environment with the robot that can exchange them uh, the different support and uh, continuous data collection. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, there is still a lot of development that is ongoing uh, to the sample delivery methods for serial crystallography. Uh, some of them are um, the sandwich uh, in which the uh, crystal slurry is sitting uh, between two films. There is microfluidic, uh, there are larger support uh, like the silicon chip. Uh, there are um, high viscosity um, in extruder where the crystal is in, in, they are embedded in a thick matrix and they are extruded in front of the bean. Uh, we have been working in order to integrate the, uh, all of them um, at the bean line. Uh, of course, this is going to be part of the sample preparation uh, and discussion, uh, preliminary discussion with the user in order to configure the B9 and uh, uh, prepare the setup accordingly. And in parallel, uh, we have the sample preparation lab uh, where the users can come ahead of time to test the sample preparation and uh, validate their um, the recipe. So in uh, in a nutshell, uh, ID29 is going to be the first uh, world line dedicated to time resolved serial crystallography at the fourth generation synchrotron. It's becoming a reference uh, and inspiration for similar projects that are ongoing uh, in parallel to the project of a uh, new fourth generation uh, storage ring uh, worldwide. Uh, pre presents a new design with unmatched beam characteristics. Um, I didn't get into much into the details, but we do expect and we measure, I will see in a, in a, sec in a future slide, um, more than 10 to the 15 uh, photons per second at the sample position. And it's uh, equipped with a later generation uh, synchronization device that uh, brings together uh, the SRF development uh, um, of the storage ring um, synchronization system with uh, the SSX uh, faster scanning system of the diffractometer. Uh, we are going to keep them, we're going to receive it in uh, June, uh, nanosecond laser with a very high repetition rate. We pick the repetition rate, uh, which is half of the acquisition um, rate in order to be able to do a sequence of uh, illuminated and dark uh, diffraction uh, images uh, on, um, on the, small, on the nano, uh, micro crystal and is equipped, as I said, with uh, a Jungfrau detector. It aims to become the Perfect facility both for serial crystallography experts, while well, they can come with their own uh, setup and we can integrate it on, on the B line, but also aims to become user friendly uh, for people that, or user group that are becoming uh, to approach to use uh, serial crystallography as they are uh, one of their techniques for their uh, structural studies. And uh, we have uh, um, a simple preparation laboratory where the users can come and uh, prepare their sample and check if their sample preparation is suitable for the measurement on E29. We are opening for a bug proposal uh, for the deadline on the 1st of March for the second run of 2022, so from uh, September uh, onwards. Um, this is a rough um, timeline. 
for uh, we are here at the moment, February 2020. We are, as we speak, they are um, installing uh, the uh, devices on uh, EH1, so the experimental hatch. Most of the devices have been already commissioned, uh, pre commissioned offline, so the integration is going to be um, rather uh, straightforward. And we are taking a proposal, as I mentioned before, from the first uh, um, or March, and we are already in contact with some friendly users. To, so that they can come after the May shutdown, so to, from the beginning, from the end of May uh, until July uh, to do some preliminary experiment uh, with us uh, so that we can prepare uh, to resume the user mode in, uh, in, in September. Yeah, here's some picture. This is the, the first uh, uh, full monochromatic beam that we took. This is the beam at the sample position when we did the radiation test. And this is a diode, and this is the photon flux that we measure in, uh, let's say, submatting our condition because at the time the uh, focusing system was not yet. Uh, um, was not yet installed. And this is the sample setup that uh, we have prepared, Julian, uh, um, postdoc on 29, has prepared uh, in the lab next to the, uh, that you see here, in the lab uh, next to the beam line where the users can prepare their samples. And this is an example of using a high viscosity uh, extruder. So this is a very important, do, uh, the pre-characterization of this kind of samples is uh, very important to make an optimum use of, um, of the beam time. So as I said, the beam try to conclude, uh, then yeah. yes. Okay, I'm concluding. So for the meantime application, as I said, we have the deadline from the first of March for bug application, and that's it's uh, as regular from the back two deadline for a year. And we have also for uh, less regular users the possibility to access through rolling beam time. Well, the call is uh, permanently open, uh, but of course uh, we are uh, happy to hear um, from the users if they have any questions. So I'm just concluding uh, with. Thanking probably not uh, uh, almost all the people included uh, that participated in the project. Hope that I didn't forget anyone on this slide and uh, you for your attention. Thank you, Daniele. Um, okay. Um, if I look at the questions uh, uh, for Daniele, they are coming up. Uh, and um, the first one is uh, from. Um, Alexander Yevanov uh, is uh, the bandwidth of the fourth generation synchrotron was supposed to be of the order of 0.5%. What is actually the bandwidth spectrum of the pink beam at EBS and why do you still need a multi-layer monochromator at ID29? So the bandwidth uh, of the ondulators that we have, uh, if I remember correctly, is about 2.5%. Uh, in the simulation that we made with 2.5% beam, uh, um, the the spots for larger for crystal with a large unit cell were going to pro to produce uh, uh, too much overlap. So then we use a multi-layer to minimize the bandwidth uh, to reduce the bandwidth to 1%. This is also gives uh, a better compromise uh, in terms of heat load that we need then to dissipate downstream uh, in order to run the choppers. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, Chloe, um, Chloe Zubieta is asking you uh, about microfluidics, uh, which will be really important, and how the users will ha have access to the mi microfluidics chips. Uh, this made in house. Uh, how versatile will the beam line be for different microfluidics devices? Um... So this is a, somehow a work in progress that we are doing in collaboration with the partnership for soft condensed matter here across uh, the street. Uh, we are making a, a few design that we are currently testing on the other beam lines. I would say that the design it's more um, linked to the kind of measurements that the users will like will like to do. And so we have a certain degree of flexibility because, as you know, they are 3D printed, so they can be produced very, very uh, quickly. Yeah. Thank you. There's a lot of questions also for Paul, but Paul is answering directly. So <laughs> we are not going to go through them yet. We may come back to them. I will ask Paul to summarize the, the questions at the end um, of this session. So uh, we thank Daniele and uh, we can uh, move uh, to the next presentation that he is uh, coming from uh, Raffaella Torchio, uh, who is going to tell us about uh, the high power laser facility uh, on ID24 and maybe the first user uh, activity there. Raffaella, to you. Okay. Can you hear me and can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
So yes, uh, here are latest news from ID24. So uh, specifically the new high power laser facilities, but also other, other activities that we kept uh, on this beam line. And uh, first of all, just uh, a recall that uh, ID24, uh, it's uh, um, a X-ray um, absorption spectroscopy beam line that was historically uh, composed of two energy dispersive branches. Uh, but with the advent of the EBS uh, up, uh, upgrade, so the EBS source, one of the two branches was converted to uh, scan energy scanning with the implementation of the DCM um, monochromator. So this branch is presently, as uh, Haima said, is under construction and will soon start commissioning. So you will hear more likely next year in the next user meeting. So today I'm telling you about news about the, the branch that remains energy dispersive and becomes uh, fully dedicated to time resolved experiment. So namely a laser shock experiment with the new HPLF facility, but also a pulse magnetic field experiments and other user experiments that require time resolution, such as for example, uh, fast chemistry. So <clears throat> the energy dispersive setup um, is uh, relies on the use of a cord crystal that diffracts um, all energy at the same time and basically focus at the sample and redisperse on the detector and basically allows for uh, the um, full spectrum, uh, absorption spectrum at once that gives us the uh, time resolution. So uh, an example of, of the three experiments that we uh, perform on, on this beam line so this is the pulse magnetic field experiment setup that was developed in collaboration with the, the lab of intense magnetic field uh, in uh, Toulouse uh, years ago. So this setup allows to reach uh, pulsed uh, fields up to 30 Tesla in pulses of uh, one millisecond. And the combination to X-ray absorption is interesting because uh, it gives information to both the local structure to the xanes and the magnetism through the XMCD, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. So this setup is just about to be recommissioned uh, in this week, so in two days. Another experiment um, example uh, that requires the time resolution of the energy dispersive setup is fast chemistry. So this example was performed with the, the stop flow uh, setup in collaboration with the um, Universita La Sapienza. Uh, and this allows, for example, to uh, monitor very fast uh, chemical reactions or intermediate phase uh, along uh, chemical reaction or, or catalysis down to the, um, the 20 millisecond uh, time resolution in combination between X-ray absorption spectroscopy and UV uh, invisible uh, spectroscopy. So, and this setup will be recommissioned in, in April 22, will be again available. And now, uh, so I will talk about the high power laser facility, the uh, big project that just uh, came to life uh, last December. So uh, this um, project consists in coupling a high powerful laser, so namely a 100 joule nanosecond laser, uh, 2ID24ED, to perform laser induced dynamic compression experiment probed by single bunch X-ray absorption. This is uh, based on the um, <clears throat> laser ablation technique. So when a laser hits a target, uh, it creates a plasma on the surface and the subsequent expansion of this plasma gives rise to a shock wave in the target that brings the target to um, uh, both uh, extreme condition of pressure and temperature at the same time. Uh, these conditions can be very extreme. With this laser, we will be able to reach up to the terapascal range and several tens of uh, kilokelvin. And this is relevant to uh, reach extreme conditions of matter, even ecstatic state of matter, such as the uh, warm dense matter range. So warm dense matter is an intermediate state in between condensed matter and plasmas. And this is relevant uh, for planetary science to describe the interior of the planets. We can also uh, mimic uh, space impacts. Uh, warm dense matter is as well uh, relevant uh, for inertial confinement fusion for the intermediate phase during compression of uh, inertial confinement fusion. And when we remain in more moderate condition, uh, dynamic compression is interesting um, 
uh, to watch at the behavior of materials on the high strain rate to be compared to the static compression that is largely uh, developed at the SRF, because material can behave very differently because of kinetics, um, deformation, nucleation of phases. So uh, in both uh, cases, so in conditions and in strain rate, this facility is very complementary to a static compression that is developed on ID27 and other facility, other beamlines at the SRF. So the amplitude laser was delivered to the SRF in June 21 at 50 joules, so half, half of its uh, nominal energy, but it should be upgraded to 100 joule in this week. And we uh, perform uh, the first proof of principle, let's say first friendly users experiment in, in December. So the laser was installed in the clean room that we built uh, behind uh, the beam line during um, the shutdown, the long shutdown. Try to conclude the Rafael. Yeah, so this is a picture of our setup. Uh, this is the laser transport that brings the drive laser to the chamber. X-rays come from here to the fast detector. And this year we also installed um, a shock uh, diagnostic visor reflectivity thanks to uh, strong involvement of our um, collaborators and users. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, this is a pulse, um, the 50 joule pulse in 10 nanoseconds. This is the image of the laser after a phase place of 250. These are the images of the shock diagnostics visor and the reflectivity. They allow to monitor the condition of the matter during the shock wave, as well as the laser profile, the shock profile. So this is very is crucial. Uh, and this is the proof of principle that we performed in the last night of the experiment. Uh, so we were able to um, laser induce uh, dynamically the BCC to HCP transition in iron that was compressed to 50 GPA. And if you want to know more about this uh, new adventure and opportunity, uh, you can uh, listen to the talk by Jean-Alexis Hernandez tomorrow in the micro symposium dedicated to high pressure. So this last slide um, summarizes the parameters of uh, ID, the beamline, so X-rays, laser, and uh, the shock diagnostics that we have settled so far. So I will not go into details unless you have questions, but uh, you, you can see here all the parameters. And uh, just I want to thank all the HPLF team for their strong uh, involvement and uh, hard work to set up this very complex uh, uh, instrument. Thank you. Thank you, Raffaella, for this uh, very nice talk and exciting opportunities. Uh, I do not see a lot of uh, questions yet, but uh, you will get them on the chat. In fact, uh, there is a very active chat of uh, discussion with Paul and, uh, and Daniele. And uh, so I'm sure that there will be questions for you as well. So time is tight and we move to the last presentation uh, from ID27. We stay in high pressure and extreme conditions. It's Mohamed that is going to, uh, Mohamed Mezwar, who is going to give the presentation. Mohamed, go ahead. Okay. We can see. You can see the slides. Yes. All good. Okay. So um, I will tell you about the latest news from ID27, uh, which is the high pressure static beamline, even though we are not static. <laughs> um, okay, um, first, uh, short reminders about the general context of this uh, new uh, instrument, uh, which was fully dedicated to micro diffraction studies under extreme PT conditions. And uh, this instrument was in operation for quite a while since 2006, and we considered that it was time for change, and uh, we proposed uh, to completely rebuild uh, this instrument uh, and propose the project for high flux nano diffraction beamline for science in the extreme conditions with uh, also fluorescence and imaging, uh, imaging capabilities. Uh, this instrument was based on uh, a qu quite strong scientific case and four key areas were, were identified at this time to study materials uh, at and beyond the current limit of static pressures and high temperatures. So this meant uh, obviously, to increase the, the spatial resolution uh, down to uh, 300, about 300 nanometer. Uh, also, to study the structure and chemistry of low Z melts and, and glasses um, under extreme conditions. And 
also this involves uh, uh, the use of high flux and uh, to transform the beamline into uh, a ping beam beamline as well to, to, to allow for ping beam operation. Uh, another field of, uh, of importance is, was also to study fast melting kinetics of chemical reactions. Uh, again, here we'll need also very high flux to reach a uh, higher time resolution down to uh, microseconds, uh, which is the time scale where this uh, phenomena um, happen. And finally, a completely new field uh, of interest was a uh, possibility to study uh, the rheology of materials by fast X-ray imaging. And uh, for this, we would need to exploit uh, the coherence of the new uh, of the, of the EBS. Uh, which was, which is now uh, for high energy, because most of high pressure experiments are performed at high energy, and now with the coherence uh, properties of the source, uh, this is actually under under reach. So, uh, based on this scientific case, we we defined uh, certain uh, features for the new instrument. First of all, we needed a very uh, intense uh, source, and uh, the choice we've made was for a cryo cooled uh, U18 undulator. A mini gap on the later on the on the EBS, of course, and the expected gain in flux as compared to the to the current uh, situation was uh, is about a hundred uh, in monochromatic and three orders of magnitude in pigment, so quite a substantial gain uh, in flux. Also, it meant uh, also the extension uh, to a long beamline, 120 meters long beamline, and this was essential for high resolution and with fractured experiment. Also important for poor field uh, X-ray imaging. And also this beamline, uh, we defined a certain uh, level of uh, flexibility uh, by uh, using tunable, uh, tunable energy from 15 to 60 kV. Uh, this is quite important for if we want to combine diffraction, fluorescence and imaging on the same beamline uh, without uh, any compromise on each of the techniques. And also we needed switchable uh, optics. To do to go from uh, to work on monochromatic operation for high resolution nano and micro diffraction uh, and high energy coherent uh, diffraction and imaging the ping beam operation for time resolved diffraction fluorescence and imaging down to my one microsecond time scale and finally a variable focal spot size from uh, 0 0.3 times 0 0.3 to 10 by 10 micro to cover all the applications defined in the, in the center case uh, very important also is the uh, detector. So uh, we purchased um, a large area high energy canon telluride pixel with uh, very high frame rate up to 250 hertz and also a very high dynamic range. Okay, um, now I will tell you about the current status of this beamline. So the objective uh, pre COVID planning was to resume user operation at the end of 2021. And I uh, can say that it was quite a challenge to keep this. Uh, during during this period, but uh, we we could manage uh, with some uh, let's say luck, but also <laughs> a lot of work by, by the people to 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 make efforts in all direction to to keep this objective. Um, so the beamline is is as is designed here. We have two optics hutch and one uh, experimental hutch uh, OH one OST uh, a double multi layer mirror, which provide the pin beam actually. And OH2 um, is and this DMM is permanently in the in the in, in the white beam, so it provides a ping beam to the second optical hutch where the DCM is, and uh, this DCM provides monochromatic uh, beam, uh, and we can move it out and to 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 let pass the, the ping beam into uh, EH. Sorry, I went a bit too fast. Uh, this is actually the status of these elements are now finished, installed, and fully commissioned. Uh, then uh, a word about the experimental arch. It's quite it's a large uh, thermostabilized uh, experimental arch, uh, which is compatible with uh, nano focusing. Um, it's based on five actually granite units. The first one hosts three kb mirror systems for different uh, the beam spot sizes and energy domain that we can move horizontally to uh, change configurations. Then we have three uh, goniometers, goniometer uh, one for heavy duty. Um, which can host uh, systems like the Paris, the Denver Press, cryostats, or any heavy duty um, sample environments. Then we have a nano goniometer for 2D scanning in fluorescence and diffraction. And then finally, uh, we have a uh, goniometer three here, which is a laser eating uh, goniometer, uh, which is compatible for, which is with YAG and CO2 laser, for YAG and CO2 laser experiments. 
Then we have uh, ancillary uh, granite here that we can move in and out uh, where we can install um, ancillary equipment such as Raman and solar suite systems. And here uh, on the last bench, we have a, a detector, detect, detector bench that we can move uh, from uh, 0.5 to 3 meters from the sample, say. And it can host the, the Heiger 2, um, it hosts actually the Heiger 2 condensate for diffraction and the X ray imaging. Uh, detector, which is not represented here, and uh, we can also, sorry, we can also, it can also host the vortex or instead detector for X-ray emission spectroscopy, and we can combine all this in different manners that I will not, uh, of course, describe today. So this is a photography of the um, uh, photograph of the of the beamline, of the beamline uh, as it is today. So it's quite uh, busy. You can recognize here the goniometer one. Uh, for heavy duty, going to make two for nano focusing, and uh, here we have the uh, the third one that we just actually installed. That's why it looks still a bit busy, not completely finalized. Uh, but we plan to uh, to test it actually next week uh, in the framework of a long term uh, proposal, and it's um, it's quite um, quite nice. And um, the people from also from the mechanical mechanical engineering did uh, quite a good job. So about the DCM, or now about the performance of the beamline, just a word about the DCM uh, that were performed extremely well. I would say uh, we get at 33 meters from the source uh, beam size that is close to theoretical values, very high beam stability at 110 meters below uh, about 100, 100 uh, nano, nano radians, which is uh, what we need to perform the nano focusing experiments. And I think it was a question before about the undulator harmonics. Uh, here we measured it uh, through the monochromator. You have about 0.5% uh, bandwidth, which is uh, what we expect from uh, from this uh, from the from the monochromator. Also, the DCM uh, rocking curve, uh, as you can see, extremely small, meaning that the mechanics of this of this system is very good, and you could uh, measure the um, k edges to fix the energy uh, quite easily. Here is the measured beam spots. So I think uh, before I talked about the KB3 system, we already commissioned the KB3 system um, uh, and we obtained a quite nice, um, also nice beam spot about 1.7 micron by 2 micron, which is actually the theoretical limit for this particular system. Uh, two weeks ago, we also tested the KB1 system, which is a nano, the high quality GTEC mirrors, and we obtained also something below 300 nanometer in both directions, which is uh, within the specifications, uh, we need to, to further test the, these mirrors, but this is quite quite promising. We also collected uh, the first uh, photo pattern uh, in November, um, and as you can see here, inside the diamond angle cell, as you can see the transmission, this is a diamond angle cell, and we got quite high resolution, about 0 0.03 degree, which is twice uh, as, as, as uh, better than what we, we had before, so quite promising as well. We also did the uh, single crystal, uh, first single crystal uh, measurements in a diamond angle cell. And, um, and we, again, here we qu fully qualified the, the diffractometer and we obtained uh, on a school case sample what vanadinite, uh, very good air factors of uh, two, about 2%. So what I could say at this stage is that I did 27 already completely surpasses the performance of the previous beamline. I did 27, I did 27 for one. Um, despite the fact that C CPM U18 is not yet installed, we are still using a U23, and uh, CP CPM U18 will be installed this summer. And uh, also, uh, despite uh, the high performance KB mirrors are not fully uh, commissioned. So we performed the first user experiment uh, at the end of November, as initially planned, and this was quite a, a good achievement. And the first group that we hosted was the group we of- should, uh, uh, we, we should try to sum up. Okay, that's my last slide actually. Okay, good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, first user that we had was uh, the group of Leonid Dubrovinsky, and they could map actually inside the diamond. This is uh, 2D mapping inside the diamond anvil cell uh, where you can see uh, the grain distribution and a very nice and sharp diffraction uh, peak from very single grains in, in, the, in the cell. And they could actually already resolve uh, structures that they were not able to resolve at other sources. So this is quite uh, quite uh, promising. And with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, some of the contributions, not all of them, of course. Uh, this, these are almost 100 people that could not fit in this slide. 
Thanks, Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Mohamed. I had a disturbing uh, comment. Uh, apparently, some people couldn't see the slides. I could see them. Ah. I don't know what happened, but um, I hope uh, that uh, most of the people was able to see uh, your slides. Otherwise, uh -huh. uh, I don't know that's, what's that's strange what because problem. For me, it was no problem. So uh, I think some... it was only me. I, once I restarted Zoom, it was working well. Ah, okay. I'm fine. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I prefer okay. to hear that. All right. Otherwise, All right. <laughs> so we are 12, 12. We started five minutes late, but I think we should hear Annalisa that I hope can summarize a very complex matter, which is the new access mode in 10 minutes. And then uh, uh, if you're not too hungry, we can try to see if there are some questions. Uh, that okay. Um, now, let me see if I can share. I will unshare mine uh, yeah. first. Uh, Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. OK, so. Um, wanna go um, in the, uh, maybe I, you want to go in the presentation. One second. OK, <laughs> so um, hello to everybody. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite uh, uh, rewarding to see how many people are, are participating to this uh, user meeting. So um, I'm going to give you some news about uh, uh, new access models. Um, so we all know about uh, the standard time request, which is essentially can be a long term one or, or short term, term one, but essentially is a one user and one, one experiment. Now, however, the, the, the problem is that uh, quite some time ago, it has been recognized that uh, this, this uh, uh, mode can have uh, uh, limitations. And one obvious limitation is, uh, if I just tell you that uh, over the 30 years of life of VSRF, there have been more than 46,000 proposals. So of course, uh, um, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to, to deal with uh, such a number. So um, um, for this reason, the user uh, um, um, uh, study has uh, uh, suggested two new modes of uh, um, allocation, and they are essentially group uh, allocations. Now, some of you uh, is uh, certainly already familiar with the concept of BAG, Block Allocation Group, because this has been uh, introduced for the first time at the SRF long, long, some, some, time, some time ago, but only for the, the uh, proposals for the uh, structure biology. Now there are these two, um, two modes, and the, mm -hmm. let me explain to you the, the difference between bugs and the hubs. So in both cases, they, they are group uh, proposals, but in the bug uh, group, um, there is a, a, the, the different groups are uh, clustered together. A, under an independent uh, principal investigator, and they work on similar scientific or technical projects and share in time. And this also means that they decide for uh, priorities. They will generally work, work independently one from the other and do not necessarily share results unless they, they, they wish to do it. In the hub access mode, uh, then uh, the groups are uh, uh, under, mm, there's, it's very similar to BAG, but the groups work together on the same uh, scientific team. And uh, uh, obvi obviously they share uh, bin time, but also knowledge and uh, publication. So this is a, a tighter way to, uh, to share the uh, bin time. Now, what are the uh, advantages of uh, these two uh, new modes. Well, it's uh, obvious that uh, in one case uh, with uh, the STD, uh, experiments are independent and uh, in a certain sense, uh, less efficient. Whereas with the bugs and the hubs, the community um, uh, allows, the, the proposals allow a single setup for any users and n projects. 
there are also several other advantages that uh, I think are all similarly important. So, for instance, uh, these new uh, two modes uh, encourage users co communities to agree on the importance of certain projects and uh, obviously set up priorities. Also ensures uh, regular access to ESRF and, uh, and a, a better and more efficient uh, usage of the beam time. And also it re uh, reduces the, uh, the setup and take, take down time because uh, obviously they are clustered together under the same uh, setup. Finally, a, 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 a very important uh, um, result is that uh, these modes uh, create, help to create creating um, uh, scientific synergy within uh, certain communities. So this, this is really quite a, an important thing. Currently, there are already three pilot studies and that were chosen to, um, to maximize uh, pilot studies to maximize the differences. So one is uh, there are two bugs and one uh, hub proposal. And uh, the, the two bugs are one on uh, historical materials. Uh, and the second one is uh, on uh, uh, materials under rapid or extreme uh, loading. The hub instead is a, a multi-scale, multi-techniques uh, investigation of uh, batteries. And this is quite important because uh, clusters together the, uh, has facilitated the, the, um, the birth of uh, the Noble uh, battery hub. Um, now, for the governance, the review um, report uh, and the selection, we are still working on uh, defining the details. The plan is to open uh, this uh, new uh, access mode to mm, the full ESRF community in 2023 after uh, the endorsement of, uh, of the Council. Uh, the, the hub proposals will have a, a one deadline per year on the 15th of uh, January of each year, uh, which is the same as the uh, long-term projects. Whereas uh, the deadlines for, uh, for the bugs would be twice a year, the 1st of March and the 10th of September. There will be some uh, uh, limitations in the sense uh, that, that currently there are no more than 30% of the single bill line um, that is assigned to LT LTPs, uh, so that there is enough time for uh, regular standard uh, proposals. The same condition will be kept, but uh, um, uh, in, in a way that uh, in general, no more than 40% of the bin, bin uh, time on a single bill line uh, should be assigned to a combination of uh, LTPs, bugs, and hubs. With this, I terminate my uh, presentation and uh, please um, do ask questions if, uh, um, if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annalisa. It was very nice and clear, your presentation. So um, this is, um, you know, a first information that uh, we wish, wish, wish to share with you, the community, just to, uh, you know, solicit your interest and uh, to realize that in one year time, there would be new uh, opportunities for getting beam, line, uh, beam time at the ESRF. Um, uh, we are at 12.20, so we are right on time in terms of the timing, uh, but I think uh, we can spend another few minutes to try to answer a few questions. Um, I don't see questions for Annalisa yet. There were many for Paul. Uh, I think an interesting one that uh, could be of a general interest for uh, uh, the audience was uh, linked to uh, um, uh, asking uh, uh, Paul why you need uh, such a long hatch. Uh, yeah, people understand uh, that uh, you know you can uh, uh, look at uh, different distances with your detector from your sample, but um, you know how how is this uh, uh, really making uh, uh, new opportunities? So we have seen uh, the data on the brain, so that somehow is telling us as compared to BM five. The, the increased contrast that you can get, but can you be a little bit more exhaustive on this point, which I think is really of a general uh, interest? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, so due to my Zoom problem, I cannot restart the camera. Um, so yeah, the long distance, uh, when you do propagation phase contrast, you have to, to know that the level of contrast you, you have decrease when you have larger pixel size and when you go to higher energies. So if you want to image large objects that are typically uh, very absorbing, and so you need high energies to go through, and you need to have large pixels because they are large objects. If you want to have enough contrast, the, the best way to do that is to go to very long propagation distance, as long as the source is coherent enough to do it. So that's why BM18 has been done with a, a so long edge and a, on, a, on a bending magnet port because the coherence is so good that in fact, uh, we would still be able to make propagation phase contrast for 50 microns pixel size with 500 meters of propagation. It's just, we had to limit to 45 meters because after there is a road and a river, so it would have been difficult to go to 500 meters. But basically, uh, it's just, if you want to go to larger objects, uh, it's important to have access to very long propagation distance. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so the um, the next um, the next next point I think may be for uh, uh, for um, uh, Daniele. There was a question about uh, experimental hatch number two. What's that for on uh, ID twenty nine? And also some questions about uh, the bag uh, to ID twenty nine, uh, which will be specific to this beamline. I don't know if you want to comment uh, on these two points. Uh, so the the second hatch was intended to be. Um, uh, a, a sort of sandbox for CR crystallographic experiment with a more uh, flexible experimental setup that we can modify uh, while the experimental is still running on the first experimental hatch and to do a high energy diffraction experiment. And how this is given the current situation and the pressure to bring a EH1 uh, in operation has been put on hold for, uh, for the moment. But uh, it's something that I hope that we can resume in uh, in the near future. Uh, regarding the bag application, uh, so yes, so basically, it's something similar for those who are familiar with the cryo EM. Um, the bag beam time for the D29 will be uh, allocated after a specific proposal for ID29, and will not be distributed as part of the standard MX proposal. Okay, thank you. Then uh, uh, we just received a, a question um, on um, hub proposals, and it's a little bit about uh, the logistics. Uh, in particular, uh, I think there's a lot to learn there. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, the, the question is coming from Eli, Eli Maria Sharalam Pidu. And uh, uh, she was asking uh, explicitly how it's going to work. Are you going to have a PI and several colleagues? Uh, uh, um, My understanding is that, uh, yes, there will be a coordinator. And then I suppose that there will be uh, quite flexible in terms of, uh, of uh, um, how is the, the, the hub is, uh, is dealt uh, um, by, by the different uh, um, uh, participants. So, for instance, I can imagine I can imagine that uh, uh, one would like to uh, to organize a steering committee, and uh, the steering committee will decide together with the community on how to pr prioritize the ex experiments. Uh, but I think many of these um, details will become clearer when the pilot studies are uh, are over. Okay, yeah, I I think uh, I fully uh, support what Annalisa said. Uh, basically, if I understand also correctly, the idea is uh, that there will be a, a steering committee in the bag that in the hub that will have to coordinate all the different activities that may be also extra ESRF, and these activities then will have to fulfill a certain. Um, a return of information to the uh, ESRF beam time review panel uh, and, um, and, and also uh, to the overall uh, follow up of um, uh, the science use of the ESRF. So, um, 
In the hub, I have another uh, question from Adriana Miele. Uh, in the hub, will it be needed that the scientists have already publications together? Mm, this I don't think is definitely necessary, not at all. I think the hub concept is really to uh, to uh, to strengthen the uh, the efficiency of the use of the ESRF on areas that very often have um, a sort of more uh, science science applied uh, aspect uh, and relevance on the societal challenges and so on and so forth. So it yeah, like in, in the case of the battery. The yeah, battery for, example, the, for, for example, for, for development of uh, battery uh, research in combination with many other activities in uh, battery science and application. Okay, so um, with that, uh, I think we can uh, uh, conclude this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this panel and uh, this activity, this time uh, dedicated uh, to the ESRF. Um, we just gave you a glance what we could do in uh, 45 minutes uh, that were stretched to 55 uh, about uh, uh, all the things that are going on. So as you can see, ESRF is up. EBS is uh, providing a fantastic new source but the source is not all. It's also very important to have excellent beam lines and the ability to exploit these beam lines in the best possible way. One issue that hasn't really been mentioned here, and I take the liberty to, uh, to mention it, is that all these beam lines, and some of them in particular, like the M18, will produce a huge amount of data. So we will also have to face uh, 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 the, this, this issue that on a specific experiment that may come to the extraordinary numbers of fractions of a petabyte per day. And uh, we will have to develop an infrastructure that will enable uh, both um, uh, 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 online or a pseudo online real time data analysis, as well as a full pipeline to enable the users then to uh, uh, analyze their data once the experiment is over. So um, these are uh, huge challenges that are not only uh, for ESRF, but also more uh, commonly for uh, synchrotron and X-ray science in general. And there are many, many initiatives that are uh, ongoing uh, um, in Europe and in the world and in France, to which the ESRF is uh, trying to um, um, be part of uh, in a measure in which they can contribute to solve this uh, data challenge. But also the ESRF has internally um, uh, defined uh, data um, uh, management, uh, scientific data management plan, which is being launched with the endorsement of the ESRF Council and the ESRF governing bodies, and uh, um, uh, which will enable or to scale up by at least a factor 10 uh, the uh, capacity that the ESRF has today uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, manage scientific data in the coming uh, um, five years or so. So, um, of course, I do not have the time to discuss that now, but uh, this is something that I wish you to know uh, that is also very high in the agenda uh, of the coming years and crucial for the proper exploitation of the facility. So, uh, with that, I would like to close this session and thanking again the user organization for giving us this opportunity to talk to you about all the things that we are doing at ESRF for your program. Thank you.